My next guest, he is an MMA fighter with a record of nine wins, one loss, and one draw. He's a very, very busy person, and I'm very excited to be able to have him on the show. He is Jose Shorty Torres. How's it going, Jose? It's great, man. I'm alive. I'm exhausted from uh, Christmas week, uh, going from literally, I think it was like 10 degrees when I left Chicago to about like 65, 70 degrees of Florida. But, you know, I, I don't really sleep the best. So getting here at midnight, doing these late night travels and then doing a practice in the morning, practice at night and then being busy in the middle of the day. Um, getting back to it after a long week is exhausting because, you know, your mind is like, yeah, I want to do all this stuff. But your body's like, dude, take it slow. Come on, man. Take it easy. So um, definitely dying a little bit tonight. But, you know, the first day is always the hardest. Hey, well, first of all, you know, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you taking the time. No problem, man. Awesome. No problem. Happy holidays, I, I, man. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Happy holidays back. And yeah, I, I have the energy to talk. I probably don't have the energy to get up and run, but I definitely have the energy to talk and, and have some fun. <laughs> Awesome, brother. So uh, right now you're currently signed with uh, Brave FC, correct? Uh, Brave CF, yeah. So it's Brave, Brave Combat Federation. I know it's funny because a lot of people say FC. It's just yeah. Titan FC, all these different promotions at FC. Definitely. So um, they decided to mix it up a little bit, confuse the fans, if you want to say. Yeah. And it's Brave Combat Federation. And, man, it's, it's been around for a few years, but they've been able to travel the world. They've been able to sign a lot of UFC um, you know, veterans like myself. And it's it's been – you know, a crazy thing, especially for us, for us flyweights that were released from the UFC, um, yeah. Brave decided to take advantage of it. And we're doing this flyweight tournament, given COVID kind of postponed it back a little bit. Yeah. But, uh, no, it is what it is. And it's, it's, it's a tough fight. You know, all these, all these are tough matches for the tournament. So you say, uh, you talk about, you know, COVID. COVID's definitely uh, changed a lot of things for the year 2020. A lot of unexpected things. A lot of businesses have had to, you know, uh, adjust, adapt. So how is it like for you as a fighter, uh, Jose, just to start off, how was it like dealing with uh, the whole COVID and the kind of restrictions that you had to deal with as a fighter? Um, you know, for me, it, it became difficult because my promotion is international. So they don't fight in the U.S. My promotion is overseas. So there's, because we are the COVID capital of the world, the U.S. has travel bans. So um, almost every country has a travel ban against Americans. So for example, my fight was supposed to be December 18th in Russia, and then Russia itself was like, hey, man, we're not letting anyone in the country, doesn't matter what nationality. And then January 16th coming up, and it's a bunch of Russians, a bunch of Middle Easterns, a bunch of Europeans, all that stuff. And they're like, everyone can come in except for Americans. So it's like my opponent and myself were just like, man, we're, we're just waiting. You know, we want to play, but we can't play. So it becomes difficult where, you know, think about for, for the average person who works nine to five. Yeah. You know, it's like, think about you're working nine to five for – um, you know, two, three weeks. And then they're like, hey, man, we can't pay you this week. We're going to pay you next week. And it's like, oh, okay. And then next week comes, you don't get paid. The next week comes, you don't get paid. And it, that's pretty much what it is for a lot of us fighters, especially at the start of it where everything was shut down, not just internationally, but inside the States as well, before the UFC even was able to, to kick things off again. So yeah. it, it does become difficult, especially luckily, luckily for me, I do save a lot of money. So I've been able to kind of just, you know, work off my, my savings and kind of live off of that. But, um, you know, for a lot of fighters that haven't had the, the blessings and opportunities that I've been given, um, you know, it becomes difficult. They have to get a full-time job. Oh, man, you know, COVID's not hiring people. Oh, man, you know, they have family, they have kids, they have whatever the case may be. So um, it, it does become difficult for us fighters. Again, we, we don't work a technical nine-to-five job, but our job is nine-to-five, if not longer than that. We might not be working those hours straight up, but, you know, for me, I practice in the morning. I practice at night. I have stuff I have to do in the middle of the day to make sure that I can do both practices. I have to make sure I'm getting sponsors. I have to make sure I'm promoting, doing this, doing that. So um, try my best to stay as productive as possible. It's been crazy, but just like everyone else, man, you know, we, we've faced our struggles, but we're pushing through and trying to find a different way to keep on going forward. Yeah. So uh, for you, Jose, uh, you know, you're, you're a very busy guy, you know, fighter, training, um, you got to keep in shape. Uh, you, I'm assuming you have some sort of like schedule that you have to keep up or a certain pace that you have to keep up through a day. Can you walk my audience through what a day is for you, Jose Torres? Um, I try my best actually not to keep a schedule. The reason okay. why uh, is because one, my schedule is so sporadic. And anytime I've created a schedule, I give myself anxiety. 
you know, it's like, oh man, I got, I had to do this stuff at this time. So I have to rush everything beforehand. And I'm a very random, spontaneous person. Sometimes yeah. I remember things last minute. I'm like, oh yeah, I got to do this. Cool. It's a perfect opportunity. Oh damn. But I have an interview at this time. I got to do this. I got to do that. Sometimes, you know, for people like yourself, you know, I, I did have to text you and go, Hey man, I, I have to push it back an extra 15 minutes. Yeah. Stuff happens unexpectedly, you know? So for me, I try my best not to keep a, a strict schedule, but I do have things I want to have done throughout the day. Um, morning is definitely practice, but in the morning, I like to get up and do my own workout first, whether it's a run, whether it's on the bike, just 30 minutes, nothing to kill myself and start my metabolism, start my, my fasting period, um, do a workout in the morning with my coach D Thomas and teammates. If he allows that, if that's, you know, part of the schedule that he's created. Um, and then I'm doing stuff in the middle of the day, whether it's, you know, stretching, trying to take care of my body, um, trying to do recovery stuff, or I'm doing stuff like I'm reaching out to sponsors. I'm trying to find out different ways to promote. I'm trying to expand my IG accounts. I'm trying to figure out different fun, clever ways to make posts, whether it's videos, photos, um, you know, and then also the, the hardest part about being an MMA fighter, I believe, is trying to live a freaking life, you know, so in the middle of the day where I do have free time, it's like, man, maybe I should go outside and play. Maybe I should go outside and say what's up to people. Maybe I should go outside and just be free like I used to. It's just COVID obviously limits that to an extent, but trying to do that. And then the same schedule I had in the morning, I have at night, you know, Dean comes back, I have another practice and I do another 30 minute workout by myself, whether it's sauna, you know, run, bike, and I'm just trying to relax, recover and, and recoup as much as possible. And all throughout the day, I'm either trying to do interviews, I'm trying to do stuff on social media, I'm trying to do stuff online that's not taxing my body, but a little bit taxing my brain. You know, this, this, this sport in general takes a toll on you. And for me, for people who don't know, I am from Chicago, Illinois. My training camp's in Florida, so I'm down here. You know, I have no fight scheduled. Yeah. So let's just say for the fun of it, I fight in March. It's right now, was it December 28th, 29th? Yeah. So that means I won't be back home with my, my mother, my brother, my, my friends, my family for three possible months, you yeah. know, and that's not even guaranteed. You know, so it's the fact of being able to find the motivation to keep that going throughout that whole process. If I'm not getting a fight, I have to look at it as a perspective. Hey man, I'm getting better through every single practice, even though I'm not getting paid for it. It's like, I'm investing time in myself. It's like, I'm spending this money that I'm spending for whatever, my camps, my, my life, whatever into myself. So it's trying to make the best out of it and keep on pushing forward again, like everyone else. So when, at what age did you start uh, this journey that is mixed martial arts, Jose? Um, I started training when I was four years old. So I've been doing this for about 24 years now. And uh, my dad is a enforcer in a gang. My brother was eight years older than me and always got beat up by my dad. So he beat me up and I got beat up by both. So it was the fact that I had to learn how to fight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, especially growing up in, you know, a gang filled neighborhood, Latinos in Chicago doing their things, rapping, whatever the case may be. Even though I was a nonviolent person, I still hate fighting today. Um, I just so happened to be good at it. I caught on to it quick and I had no choice because I was always the youngest and definitely the smallest one in my neighborhood. So I had to be that kid with the Napoleon complex and learn how to fight bigger guys and, and do these things and be proud and accept the challenge. And it took me a while, but um, when I was 16, I finally joined MMA, an actual MMA gym. I did karate since I was four all the way until I believe 16 years old, started MMA, wrestling, all that stuff. And because MMA, man, I was able to finish high school, finish college, go to college for free, um, get a academic and athletic scholarship, you know, everything was paid for. Um, man, MMA gave me a lot of opportunities and just listening to my coach and getting the right father figures, mentors, friends, relationships, all that stuff, MMA. And I just think sports in general, um, especially in the city of Chicago and just in, in lower level neighborhoods, sometimes we don't have the father figures and mentors that really help us out. And so the gym for me was a very positive place where everyone was trying to succeed. You know, I was part of a boxing gym called uh, TBT, the broke team. We were not the money team. We're the broke team. We took pride in that. You know, we have a wall of death, whether people died of cancer, drive-bys, shootings, this, that, you know, so it's the fact of fighting in general, not just boxing, it's a poor man's sport. So it's our way out of the neighborhood. So for me, my dad always wanted to fight. My brother always wanted to fight, just never had the opportunity. I did. So I took, full you know full advantage of that me i always wanted to be here on a role model so for me it was like two birds one stone and i yeah. got to do that and look where i'm at today so going back to your up upbringing and why you started fighting now was there let's see if we have any good luck with this because everyone that i've asked has told me that there really wasn't a moment but for you jose was there a moment where you saw maybe you know mma on tv where you said that's what i want to do 
period. I don't um, want to be a UFC fighter or in, you know, in that genre. Well, I, there was two things. Um, one, you know, when you're a teenager, you start to get very rebellious against your parents. And my dad, him and I didn't have the best relationship until I really got into my professional game in, in MMA. Um, that's when I guess he really started to go, oh, damn, he's actually good at this. He's trying to invest in it. You know, let's, let's spend more time together and stuff like that. But, um, I wanted to, I wanted to fight my dad. You know, my, my mom didn't really, you know, couldn't defend herself against him. My brother at the time was, what had his first near fatal injury and, and couldn't protect us anymore. So for me, my brother was like, Hey man, I'll pay for you to go to the gym for a year to learn how to fight. I was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna learn how to fight. At the same time, I was going to the local gym, export fitness or, you know, 24 hour fitness, stuff like that, planet fitness, whatever the case may be. And um, I'm training at the gym and I see the TVs up there and I see WEC and I see guys like uh, Miguel Angel Torres, which cool. he was from East Chicago and, you know, tall, skinny guy. But I was like, man, no. you know, tall, skinny guy, whatever, cool guy. Like I have the same name. My name's Jose Angel. Yeah. And then Torres. So having that, I was like, oh, his name's Miguel, my name's Jose, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So um, I was like, man, I relate to him. But then he lost to Joseph Benavidez. And I was like, Dude, this guy's a shorty. This guy's five two, five three. Yeah. Man, I'm taller than him, and I'm you know five four. And Joseph Benavides, you know, was a teammate of Uri Favor. And then looking at that, I was like, damn, Uri Favor is my height. You know, and this guy's a champion, and they're beating these guys. Man, I, if they can do it, I could do it. And I kind of saw that point of like, man, these are shorties coming up. I'm hell. My nickname was Shorty since I was born. You know, I, I was raised into the family like that. My real full nickname is Little Shorty G. So I was like, man, this is uh, um, it's it's a sign. If these shorties can do it, why can't I? So you know, I always try to symbolize like, if this shorty can do it, why can't you? So I saw them, and years later, I ended up helping Joseph Benavides get ready for Henry Cejudo. You know, I told him the story. He's like, man, shut up. I was like, no, I'm serious. Like this is you're one of my role models. You're one of the reasons why I started this sport. So it's um. It's crazy how things come to fruition, but I think the only reason I was able to push through is because I actually tried. It's mm -hmm. not that I believed in myself, because honestly, hell, I don't believe I can do a lot of things still today. Uh, and I can't even believe I did all the things I, you know, been able to accomplish. It's the fact that I just got up, tried, and listened, and just kind of went from there. And little I know, you know, stuff popped off. Now, uh, is there uh, what's the most memorable moment that you've had in your MMA career so far? Um. You know, it's funny, I just, I posted it not too long ago, you know, my, my father passed away uh, 2019 in October, and, you know, trying to look at old memories of my father, stuff like that, one of the, the fondest memories I have of just MMA in general was my biggest achievement so far to date um, was a double weight class champ for Titan FC. I did what Conor McGregor did at 14-2 and two in Cage Warriors at 5-0, and oh, and I defended a belt in the process, which he never did, so I was like, man, I'm I'm becoming a pioneer. I'm creating history. I'm doing something different. My favorite fighter of all time is Manny Pacquiao. You know, this guy's a belt collector. So I was like, you know, I'm another shorty beating up these big guys. I, I bumped up, won the belt, and hugging all my family and, and seeing the real emotion that my mom had, my brother, my 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 father, which is huge because we, we aren't, um, we don't show emotion very openly, especially towards each other. Yeah. And so seeing moments like that and, and, looking back at it, it's like, yeah, the, the achievement was great when it comes to MMA. But I think personally, emotionally, those times uh, really kind of show like how much it meant to my family. And that's the only reason I did the sport was because of them. So for me, it was, it was a huge thing. So that, that's a, you know, that's a magnificent high, you know, it's a big high. Now, tell, can you talk to me about a low point where maybe you doubted yourself or you doubted the ability that you could to do, to do this? Was there a moment where you just maybe wanted to hang it up? Oh man, I, I doubt myself every day. <laughs> um, I, and, and that's honestly just being realistic. You know, there's, there's times where like, man, I'm sore. I'm tired. I'm, I'm 28, but I feel like I'm 40. You know, it's, there's times where I, I don't want to do this most of the time. You know, I never did this for me. I did this for my family, you know? So there's definitely days where I'm like, man, what am I doing? I'm sacrificing my, my life. I'm sacrificing um, literally days of my life. I'm sacrificing time with people, relationships, friends, yada, yada, yada. You know, this, this sport is grueling. But then I look at it, I'm like, man, people would literally die to be in my position. You know, they would love to be where I'm at. They would work 10 times as harder to be where I'm at. But why did I start this sport? Not because solely of my family. It was fun. You know, so it's trying to find that fun again. But for me, I think one of the biggest times was um, my father passed away. And I didn't really know how to grieve. You know, even so today, it's it's still a process, you know, so 
I didn't know how to grieve and I had a fight three weeks later and I still decided to take the fight. I was like, oh, yo, like, what am I going to do? Like, I'm not going to just say no and, and, you know, my father's going to come back. I'm like, my father's gone. I got to push through anyways. And I pushed through. The only problem was it was the biggest event in Asia ever in, the, in like Asia's history. And I was, I was the main event, which was dope. And uh, I ended up having to back out last minute because I started to have panic attacks, anxiety attacks. My emotions were controlling my body, my controlling the weight cut, controlling everything. Yeah. And um, I was listening down to a T, but man, I was just beating myself up way more than, than I should have. I was, if I felt sad, working out was my happy place. So I would overwork and then literally kill my body throughout the process. Um, if I was sad, I would binge eat. And because I was binge eating, I was like, man, I got to, you know, get my weight down. So I would overwork that too. So I was just literally kind of killing myself. Um, and then when I kind of accepted the fact that like my father's really gone, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take this fight. I just can't do it. You know, I went home to kind of assess myself and, you know, throughout depression and, and, you know, obviously the part of grieving and stuff before then with the UFC and other, other stuff, just in life, relationship falling or whatever. Um, man, you, you start to just second guess everything. I'm not saying I was ever suicidal, but man, if a car was going to hit me, I went to move, you know? So it, it's, it's the fact of, um, it, it, I fought because of my dad and because my dad was gone. I was like, why do I fight? I didn't really have an answer, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was trying to change the perspective and trying to, instead of going, Oh, he's not here. Well, no one's watching me. Coach isn't here. So then, you know, why am I working? Yeah. It was more of like, I got to take responsibility. I'm an adult. This is bound to happen. Um, you know, I want to be able to continue a legacy. I still have my goals that I want to accomplish, whether it's an MMA or just for my family, for my dad's sake. Um, and I want to be the, the best me. I don't want to be the best fighter in the world. I want to be the best Jose Shorty Torres. And then I really do believe if I can bring the fun back into the sport again, which I really have this year and, and done a lot for myself, I believe I can almost wreck anyone, you know? So it's, it's finding motivation, finding different days and, and reasons to keep on going. But man, doubts, doubts are always going to be there. Yeah. Doubt, any day, doubts are going to be there. Hell, you could be doing your podcast right now and yeah. almost you can do a hundred of them. And I don't know, you only get a hundred views for every single podcast. And you're like, man, why is anybody watching this? Why am I doing this, doing that? And it's like, Definitely. and then you just want to quit. You're like, man, I don't really want to do this anymore. And you're like, yeah, yeah it's fun, but I, I know I'm working. I know I'm doing this, doing that. And then never know. If you, you wait it out long enough, maybe your opportunity will come. So it's the same thing with me. It's like, I'm already so far in my career. I can't just say no and do something else. I could, but then I'll never know, you know? So I, I no. want to be able to enjoy where it goes and see, see how, how, how long it goes. What's the best advice you'd give somebody that has then that, that level of self-doubt in them and maybe he's thinking about quitting, maybe he's thinking that, you know, or you maybe like, you know, a lot of people like to use 2020 and COVID and all these things as an excuse to like quit and stop doing it. What's the best advice you'd give for someone that's currently in self-doubt right now? You know, it's funny, my, my coach and excuse my language, my coach, Master Bob likes to say every, every, uh, Excuses are like assholes. Everyone has there, one. They all everyone say, has one. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. So it's it's the fact that like it's true. Like there's always an excuse. There's always yeah. a reason to complain. Like, trust me, there's always a reason to complain. <laughs> I can say this and literally I, I have friends that always try to top me. You know, they're like, Oh, you're tired. Well, I did this. And it's like it's not a competition to see what can complain more and whose life is worse. Like I, I, I'm not happy with my upbringing. I wish I would have grown up rich. I wish I would have grown up with this and that, but because of the way I grew up is the reason why I'm the person I am today. Why I have, why I had and still have the drive to, to do what I do because of my neighborhood, because of my upbringing, because of certain things, you know? So for me, when it comes to people who have doubt in themselves, whether they want to start and they're having trouble believing in themselves or are in my position and just naturally have doubt, or, you know, here and there, the hardest part is yourself. The biggest enemy is you. Yeah. How many times, have, how many times have you gone up to work every single day doing the same exact thing? No problem. And then there's always that one day you just wake up super tired. You wake up super moody and you're like, man, screw this. I don't want to do this. I hate this. I got to, now you start thinking about all the stuff you have to do every single day that you've been doing, yeah. but for some reason you start doing it and you just make it so much harder. It's the same exact work, but why is it harder? It's because of you because you're overthinking it sometimes yeah. shut up just do it and enjoy the process even if you don't like it try your best to find a little way to enjoy the process i cope with comedy so even if you're faking it to make it hey man fake it to make it maybe one day you'll make it 
I can say for the people who are starting, man, I have so many kids who hit me up and they're like, oh, I'm not as talented as you. I'm not as like, no, 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 no. Here's the thing. No one's as talented as me naturally. If you are, dude, you're going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. I say that because I grew up losing. I lost my first MMA fight. I lost my first kickboxing fight, wrestling, all that stuff. I lost almost everything and all bad. You know, so it's the fact of I could have quit right then and there. But what did I do? I got up and tried. I didn't say I believed in myself. I just go, you know what? I want to see how this goes. And I want to, you never know until you try. But you can't half-ass it and go, oh, well, I didn't make it. No, man, you either go all in or nothing. Yeah. So for me, I decided to go all in and, and look where I'm at. So I tell people, try. I never believed in myself. I never expected to make it this far. But I tried in the process. I gave it my all. And well, look where I'm at today. Yeah. So... A lot of MMA fighters start off, you know, in the amateur ranks. You just talked about how you lost your very first fight. And when you start off in, in an amateur sport, losing your first fight for some people can be devastating. What was that emotion like uh, for you after losing your first fight? You know, it's, it's crazy. So losing my first fight as an amateur and pro had been around the same feeling. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because, like, for example – I was talking to my, my, my teammate um, and she just lost her last fight and she's like, Oh man, I just got dominated. Blah, blah. I was just like, no, I wouldn't say you really got dominated, but how do you feel about your performance? She goes, well, I didn't perform the best, but I tried my best. I gave it everything I could. It's like, all right, cool. Like she was just better than you today. That's all it is. Doesn't mean you can't beat her tomorrow. Doesn't mean you can't beat her every single day after that. She was just better than you today. And that's all it is. So mm -hmm. it's the fact that when I lost my first amateur fight, I thought too much. Mm -hmm. And it was my first fight. You, know, you get scared, you're timid, you're this, you're that. And um, I started off really, really slow because I was so nervous that World Star was so popular when it like, first came out. I was yeah. like, man, if I get knocked out, I'm going to be all over World Star and this and that. You know? <laughs> so I was so scared and I lost by a split decision. And I'm like, damn, man, if I would have just tried 100%, and from the start, I would have made it. I would have won. Yeah. I don't know if my career would have gotten this great after that because that loss really taught me a lot. But um, I'm pretty pretty sure my career would have gone to shit if I would have won that first fight. But excuse my language. But yeah. um, when I made it to the UFC and I lost, I overthought the situation. There are many people that take last minute fights. There are many people that take ultimatums or given ultimatums like the UFC gave me. There are many people that they have so many things behind the scenes that they still have to push through in their job, whether it's MMA or, or whatever the case may be. I had a lot of depression going into my last fight with the UFC with Alex Perez that, you know, you think about a little shorty from Chicago, I'm fighting at the Staples Center, you know, where the Lakers play. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to go home. I didn't care. I, Monday, I got there and my fight Saturday, I was like, dude, I, I just want to go home. I don't care what happens in this fight. I just want to go home. I'm going to make this way, get paid, go home. I'll be three and one in the UFC. And I was already accepting that fact on a 34 fight winning streak. And then I lose the fight. And then besides the fact of, of losing in a TKO finish, you see him years later fighting for the title, even though he lost, which, you know, sucks. I mm -hmm. wish it would have won because it would have been like, Hey, I lost to the champ. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's the fact that it's, I lost losing at my worst compared to actually trying. If he would have beat me, man, like 100% where I was like 100% there, then, Hey, you're just a better man that day. Like, so be it. You know, I'll get another war. But the way I lost was just me giving up before I even got in there. Because it's not that I didn't believe in myself. It's just mentally all that stuff kind of leading into it. I was like, I just don't want to do this. The, the, the motivation wasn't there. The fun for me wasn't yeah. there. I don't want to do it. And uh, it's, a, it's both losses are losses I regret every single day. But those losses are extremely huge learning experiences that I don't hopefully have that experience again. Okay. So, spoiler alert for my audience, uh, after uh, you lost your first uh, amateur fight, you racked up 25 in a row. So, what's the discipline that goes into being such a, you know, terrific win streak like that, Jose? Like, what do you do to just make sure make sure you keep yourself in check? Um, I listen. Okay. You know, the, the biggest thing is you have to be coachable. And I 100% listened to my coach as much as I don't want to listen to master Bob at certain times. I want to go pro earlier. I didn't even want to finish college. I don't want to do certain things because of him. I graduated college because of him. I became an all American because of him. 
I was a two-time world champ before even turning professional, you know, because of him, I got signed to a big promotion immediately and then was on the UFC's radar from the first fight, you know? So it's the fact that because of him, I became the pioneer of amateur MMA. It's, it's the fact of listening. You need proper mentors, proper father figures, friends, even sometimes to really be there and, and kind of be real with you and be like, Hey man, I know you're great. I know you're good. I know whatever the case may be, but I don't, you don't have to be humbled. You don't have to lose to learn these experiences because I'm teaching you. You either learn through mentorship or you learn through experience. I decided, you know what, let me listen. And hopefully those experiences don't happen. I can kind of change the game and go left instead of right or go right instead of left. So I listened, man. And, and, and as much as I didn't believe um, that they were right sometimes, I was like, you know what, they've been through this experience. I haven't. So as much as I can say, no, you're wrong. I, I won't know until it happens. And honestly, I was going to do what you did, but you're telling me the opposite. So maybe like a big brother would tell his little one, maybe you should shut up and just listen to me and see where it goes. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, then Hey man, my bad. <laughs> but um, you, you got to accept that fact. Like, yeah, you got to follow your gut instincts sometimes, but if it weren't for the, the positive people I had and the good smart role models that I had with me, for example, master Bob, if I didn't listen, I, I would not at all be here. My, I wouldn't be anywhere near as talented as I am today or as skilled, should I say. Okay. So, well, then, can you talk to me about what it was like when it came to, like, the UFC release uh, that, that you went through? Um, you know, it sucked because I was used as the, the, the example. I was the very first one to get released, and it was because I had a big mouth. And it wasn't that I was saying bad things. It's just I had the business concept of, of like, man, we don't have a Conor McGregor. We don't have a Kobe Covington. We don't have guys that are popular, at least uh, marketable-wise, uh, marketability-wise in the UFC at the flyweight division. So when DJ's gone, we're probably going to start getting released. And I ended up being right. It was just an accusation. And I ended up being right. And um, calling them out going, hey, man, I'm, I'm not getting cut, right? And, Sadly, even though you're an independent contractor and they sign you for so many fights, if you lose one, they can cut you at any time. Wow. And I, and even though I took two last minute fights, I got cut and uh, I ended up promoting that and, and taking advantage of it. And in the long run, obviously I, I'm with brave CF. I actually make more money than I did um, in the UFC, which is amazing, you know? So I'm very, very happy about it. And brave takes care of me very well, but the UFC man did me dirty. Yeah. You know, you got to think about the depression that comes with it where it's like you work your whole life building this extreme resume that I had to make it to my NFL, my MLB, my you know, NHL, whatever the case may be, my yeah. professional league. And then they treat you like garbage because you end up being discriminated because you're a small guy compared to if I was in Khabib's weight class or, um, you know, Usman's weight class or any other weight class in the middle, that would have been popular. But because I was a small guy that was already in a, got signed to a dying weight class, no one cared. You mm -hmm. know, so it, it's the fact of, um, you know, it sucks. And there's still depression with it today. Like I'm still very butthurt and I feel like I'm always going to be butthurt. Like that's, that's natural. It's yeah. like hearing people's opinions. You're always going to be like, ah, as much as it doesn't really affect me, it kind of phases me a little bit, you know? So, bit. Yeah, so it's the same thing with the UFC. Like, even though I'm happy or I'm mad, I'm doing my thing and it's great. Um, you know, you, you get a little, you know, a little butthurt here and there. You're just like, man, it, it sucks, but it's, it's looking at those emotions and seeing why I feel that way and understanding why I feel that way. And making sure that I can maybe even use that negative motivation to keep on pushing me forward and, and kind of, in a sense, maybe prove them wrong and show that I, I still am one of the best in the world. Whether you are hiring flyweights or not, I'm doing my thing. I'm happy where I'm at. And I'm trying to achieve more goals no matter what promotion that is. Now, so you talk about how, you know, they did you dirty. You took two last minute fights. Uh, you know, now, with, is there a sort of pressure to take last minute fights in your profession, Jose? Or do you think it would have been just been smarter if you had to do it again and just maybe decline taking such a last minute fight for you, especially two in a row? Um, well, the, the fact was I got signed to a dying weight class. So it was either take the fight or not get signed. So for okay. me, anyone trying to get to the big leagues, you just screw it, get signed. The first fight, it is what it is. I won against Jared Brooks in whatever fashion and I got the W like you can't, you can't take it away. Yeah. So I was like, all right, whatever, you know, but then, they called me in, in the fashion that they did give me the ultimatum saying you either take this fight in 20 days or you don't fight in December. You fight sometime next year and next year can mean the following December. So it's like, 
dude, I wasn't getting paid much, and you're going to possibly hold me out for a year and a half for saying no, for already taking a last-minute fight. So it was like I was being bullied, you know, business-wise. And it's like I, I knew it was a person I believe I could beat. Like I'm not worried about anyone, but Alex Perez I knew was a force to be reckoned with. But I'm like, I'm not worried about him. Like I know he's trouble, but and he's probably going to be harder than some of the other guys. I wasn't worried about him. But when it comes to weight cuts and everything behind the scenes and how the UFC was treating me, I thought too much of it. Mm-hmm. And like I was saying earlier, other people have gone through that situation and they've prevailed. Even if they lost, they handled it better. For me, I thought too much of the situation and then I ended up losing it my worst, making the situation darker, making the situation more problematic. And I'm at where I'm at today mentally because of it. I have the skills. I'm not worried about anyone in the UFC, Brave, One, Ryzen, all these different promotions. But the way I was treated, I, I took it too personally when mm-hmm. it should have just been business. Um, do I regret taking the fight? No, because honestly, if I didn't have the knowledge, I would more than likely do the same thing again. Would mm-hmm. I say yes, I would have just never taken my UFC contract and maybe I would have just waited it out and seen where it would go, but I wouldn't have been happy. I would have wanted to always fight in the UFC. So just to say I fought in the UFC is awesome. Um, maybe one day again, but that's not my goal right now. My goal right now is being a double weight class champ for Brave. So um, it's learning from the experiences and trying to prove the world wrong in my eyes as well as to show them that I'm not just a great fighter, but one of the best in the world. Okay. Now going to uh, the next promotion that you're in right now, is there you know a fight inside for you, Jose? Um, so we have a flyweight tournament. It's a three man or it's a eight man tournament, three fights to win. I already had one, um, but it ended up being a draw. So him and I have to fight again to see who advances to the semifinals. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny because his name is Shorty Rock. Mine is Shorty G. So him and I went to a draw and we just, we got to go at it again. It just so happens that there's COVID and travel restrictions. So it kind of sucks. Um, but it is what it is. You know, us flyweights stick together. I talked to him at least once a week trying to update them, like, what's up with Brave and the promotion and stuff like that. Um, I have nothing against my opponents, man. We, we It's just business. It just so happens we all punch, in the, you know, punch each other in the face for our business. But, um, you know, it's – it's I'm excited for it. And, again, Brave pays me really well. I make more than what I did in the UFC, which is amazing. They I have respect from them, which is by far the greatest thing. I think that's way worse more than, uh, you know, than money to me. And um, – I, I know they take care of me, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Well, has there ever been, uh, I don't want to use, I guess, this term, but bad blood in a sense. Have you ever, like, went and going, sorry, have you ever been to a fight and where you kind of had a little bit of sense, like a bad blood between you and an opponent? Or has I, it always just been all respect, all business, and that's it between every single me, person? For me, I've always had all respect. Um <laughs> But I've had opponents talk smack to me. I've had opponents talk smack to my family. I've had opponents try to check me or this or that before the fights. It's like, man, just wait it out. Like, we're going to fight it regardless. If you want to do it for publicity, then do it on camera. Don't call me. Don't message me. Don't do this. Do it in front of the camera. Like, if you want to make extra money doing it that way, hey, man, do what you got to do. If you got to be a Kobe Covington and, and, and integrate that style into your game, then, hey, man, if it's making you money, do what you got to do. But I'm a Manny Pacquiao type of guy, you know, where we just kind of come in waving, having fun, laugh at the stare downs, and uh, it's just business to me. Nothing's personal when it comes to this fighting game. So I just like to have fun, and, and it just so happens this type of fun is punching each other in the face. And now uh, for in your uh, training camp, is there a specific fighter that you absolutely enjoy training with besides, I know we, you know, you like all your teammates and stuff like that, but is there a specific person that when you train with, you just click? Um, you know, man, it's, it's crazy. So it's literally me, my coach, Dean, uh, my training partner, my main training partner, Jillian Robertson. We have, we added um, David Evans to the team as well. He's another IMF guy that took uh, bronze and silver at Worlds. And he's, I believe, one and all as a pro. I'm hoping to fight sometime soon, maybe in February. But um, him, we have Greg Hardy and all these other guys. So it's only a handful of people. But my main training partner has been Jillian Robertson. So um, even though she's a female at 125, at pretty much my weight class, man, she's taught me so much when it comes to just jujitsu in general and MMA jujitsu. Her pressure is freaking ridiculous. And uh and then I'm able to teach her a little bit on, on the stand-up side. And her and I just go back and forth when it comes to training. So Dean is – is we like to mess around and say Dean's our father. And, and like, we're, we're just related. We're, we're uh, it's like, stepbrother and sister into this crazy family. And 
And we just kind of have to keep on pushing forward and helping each other out. Like we're literally all in the house together. She lives two blocks away. I stay in the house with Dean and the gym is in the garage, you know? Mm-hmm. So we're in our small space and it's one-on-one every single day. So it's me, and her working with Dean or uh, me and Dean or her and Dean and whatever the case may be. So um, having someone, you know, that's in the UFC who holds a record that I do look up to and respect very much, um, give me advice and me be able to do that, you know, back to her and kind of, you know, see eye to eye. It, it really does help a lot, man. It's it's uh, it's just having a friend there too. It's it's always nice. Nice shout out to Jillian then. Yeah, <laughs> big time. So uh, I guess Jose, uh, as we're like nearing the end of this interview, Jose, is there anything uh that you have? Uh, sorry, is there anything that you're looking forward to as far as like the year 2021 is uh, as it's coming? You know, I feel like I'm gonna be. The, the average person saying like, oh man, I can't wait till everything gets back to normal. I, it's going to be a while for that, regardless, it you is. know, whether vaccine or not, it's going to be a very long time. I think masks are going to stay around either for at least one more year or for yeah. a few more years. You never know, but um, we might be like Japan where, you know, naturally the custom is if someone's sick, hey man, just put a mask on. You can still live your everyday life, but we're walking around the mask just to be respectful. But we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But for me, for 2021, it's just another day it's another year um i don't look at it as like it's oh uh what, what's with everyone's like new year new me it's like oh yeah man. that cliche man i was like for me I, it's new year same me just hopefully not as dumb that's and i just want to be able to have fun do my thing and uh you know i've been preaching a lot of a lot about mental health as we've been talking about with this in, in the in this show yeah. it's it's a huge thing so making sure that i've been mentally stable and being able to open up and, and then, and even be open and real myself sometimes, you know, and figuring out certain situations. So I want to be, I just want to in 2021, if we want to say, if we have goals for the year is bring, and I can, I can really do say bring, and I have bring my old self back, you know, bring that childlike kid back where it's careless, fun, free, courageous, but definitely, hopefully a lot smarter. Yeah, definitely. Now, uh, so you talked about, uh, you know, self-care, self-love in that sense, mental, mental awareness, mental health. What's the best advice when you give to somebody about self-love, self-love? How important is that to you? Dude, it's, it's, it's funny because uh, a lot of people, I'm, I'm Robin Williams. I'm the guy who wants to make everyone laugh because yeah. I know what depression feels like, at least from my, my sense. You know, maybe you felt worse, whatever the case, whatever, but I'm trying to make everyone happy. When my father passed. My way to cope is with comedy. I'm trying to make everyone laugh and immediately right after we just pulled the plug. You know, it's one of those things where I'm a person that needs to make people smile. Even if I'm dying inside, I need to make people smile. You know, so it's the fact that it's very energy consuming, but um, man, you know, mental health is, is a crazy thing, but when it comes to yourself, if you can't help yourself, how the hell are you going to be able to help others? And that happened to me, especially in the beginning of the year, again, still extremely grieving about my father and then, you know, COVID hitting and being, I'm an extreme extrovert, you know, so being stuck in inside a room, literally doing nothing for months, it's like, I'm driving myself crazy, you know, it's like I want to play, I'm like bouncing the ball off the wall and I'm like, that's just somebody to play catch with or something, you know, so I'm a, I'm a child at heart. So for me, it's, a lot of people been asking me and checking up on me and they're like, dude, you take care of everyone. Can somebody just take care of you? Like, it's okay to, to check up on you. So for me, something, you know, for people who, who want advice or want any type of recommendation, talk to people, read books, events, um, be real with yourself, sing, do whatever, you know, makes you happy. Get out, see the sun, go to the park, go for a walk, do something, but don't stay inside your room because you're sad because Again, Master Bob always tells me, I think it's Newton's third law. It's like a body at motion tends to stay at motion. A body at rest tends to stay at rest. So if you're sad as shit laying in your bed all day, you ain't going to get up. No matter what you do, you ain't going to get up. So how about you actually get up, get the, the slightest lack of, of motivation and just walk, move. And little you know, things are going to almost seem back to normal. They might not be there. But it's going to be a lot closer than where you were. Again, you might not reach the goal in anything in life, but it's not the goal that matters. It's the journey and the life that, you know, approaches with that journey. So yeah. got to have fun and it's going to be a lot farther than where you originally started instead of just not trying at all. So, man, take, take care of yourself and, and just for people to listen, they got to take care of, of them. 
Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Now, Jose, uh, did you uh, catch uh, various UFC fights this past uh, year? Um, I saw a good handful. That's for sure. Okay, awesome. So I wanted to get your opinion on this. All so right. I've been seeing people's lists. You know, as we near 2020, everyone does like year-end awards, and they want to talk about the best fight, knockout of the year, submission of the year. The one thing I want to ask you is fight of the year. What when I say the fight of the year of 2020 was what go, what which fight pops into your head? Oh man, I think um, I'm trying to think if it happened this year. The one fight that is extremely memorable to me because that thing was just back and forth, um, and then honestly could have gone either way. I think it went to a split decision. Yes. Was um, uh, Joanna Young Jacek versus yes. uh, what, what, what's her name? W Wally Yang or Zhang? Uh, Wally Zhang. Yeah. So that fight, I believe, was in 2020. Yes. Um, that fight was just tremendous. Um, easily the best women's fight ever in history. For sure. And it's just. It's, it's crazy how, and I, I know you want to personally. So being able to respect her in person and then seeing that fight and seeing the struggle on, you know, on TV and then seeing her, you know, a month later, it's like, damn, like you're doing this and you're doing this right in front of me. Why can't I do it? You know, so she's an extremely motivating person. So seeing that fight, it's more of a, an emotional thing because I'm emotionally attached in that fight. And, you know, she used to be a teammate of mine. So yeah. it's the fact that it's like, damn, man, that, that's, that was such a great fight, given I'm biased. I do believe she won the fight, but, you know, it depends how you, your, your scoring criteria goes. God, man, it, it was a crazy fight. It was a crazy mm -hmm. fight. Uh, it's definitely – uh, so a lot of my friends don't watch MMA, so I'm slowly was getting into them, and the very first fight they saw was that one. It was, it was, I was like, so, so, so you need new friends. And then they also watched one of the best fights of the year – so almost every fight after that's kind of like a letdown. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Oh my goodness, I've I've tried to introduce uh, various friends uh, to the sport of MMA, and I remember the first fight that a couple of them saw was that one. Uh, mm. They saw another friend of mine. Shout out to Daisy. She saw the fight, uh, the Kelvin Gastelum versus Israel Desanya fight, which was an insane one the previous year. Fight. So they're all after that. I mean, they're just right there. That's my twin. Uh, Oh, man, shout out to Kelvin, man. He's a phenomenal fighter. Uh, and then, uh, so another fight that actually comes into my head is Dan Hooker versus uh, Dustin Poirier. I think that mm -hmm. that's a fantastic fight as well, but I, I do agree with you. I feel like that Joanna, Joanna fight uh, definitely takes the cake on that one. Take, real quick, what do you make of this whole Jake Paul, really more of a Jake Paul calling out Conor McGregor thing? What do you make of that, Jose? Um, it's dumb, but it's publicity. And, okay. you know, in this day and age, like, I'm a millennial. I'm sure you're around the same age, you know, so we're millennials. We are the start of YouTube. We're the start of me, social media, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. So everything is on the web. We show everything we do to people just to get attention, whether we are trying to deliberately do that or not, yeah. you know? So with Jake Paul, he's made his living besides, I think, I think he was on Disney, but besides Disney, he yeah. was on YouTube and Vine and TikTok and this and that. So it's like, he needs to, to, you know, he got popular for being obnoxious. He got popular for talking trash. He got popular for doing whatever. So if he throws toilet paper at Dylan Dennis, he's getting views. If he's talking smack to Conor McGregor and mocking him, he's yeah. getting views. Hell, I even made uh, a funny video on my IG mocking Jake Paul. He's getting views because I tag him in the, in the thing. He's getting the hashtag Jake Paul. <clears throat> Excuse me, people are going to follow him. So it's the fact that whether it's going to happen or not, it's a great publicity stunt. And even mm -hmm. if he loses the fight, if that happens, he gets knocked out, people are still going to watch him fight. For sure. They want to see, can he beat up Conor McGregor? Yeah, well, I'll go on the record saying that I'd never heard of this guy until I saw him knock out Nate Robinson. I couldn't believe it, man. I was like, what the hell did I just see right now? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was insane. Uh, do you think that there's a, possi a big possibility of either Dylan Dennis or Conor McGregor actually stepping into a ring with that guy? Um, I can see Dylan Dennis doing it. I don't cool. see Conor McGregor doing it. Um, Dylan cool. Dennis for sure. I know they even said rumors of um Ben Askren doing it. Um, oh my god! Or, even, or like Floyd Mayweather's fighting Logan. You know? Yeah. So, it's, uh, so money's money, man, and money can make people do some crazy, crazy things. So you never know what's gonna happen next. Very, very interesting, Jose. Uh, as we end uh, this interview, is there anything you want to let the audience know? Um, man, I just appreciate the time. And I, that's why I sell, tell people we can, we will together. We are Team Shorty. I wouldn't be able to do this without 
people's support. And even though I'm inside the cage myself, leading up to it is pretty much a crowd of people helped me out. So thank you so much. And then lastly is uh, the Team Shorty Foundation. I do have my own foundation. It helps keep kids, teens, and young adults inside the gym and off the streets, get some gear, get some funded, gets them to pay for monthly payments and do all these things. So they can stay inside the gym, find positive role models, find father figures and all that stuff and possibly make it out of their neighborhood. And um, I don't sponsor kids that are good or teens and adults. I don't sponsor them because they're talented. I sponsor them because they pay it forward in their community and in their gym as well. They've helped other kids. They've helped other people. They want to do it without looking for anything in return. It just so happens that I'm more than likely going to give them something in return. So anyone who buys stuff off my website, teamshorty.com, there is a donation link. And or if you buy stuff off my website, 100% of the proceeds go to my foundation. I literally make no money out of it. I actually lose money out of it because I'm making the shirts and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, I just want to be able to help back. Again, I want to be a hero for my town, Chicago. And I don't just sponsor people from Chicago. I sponsor people all across the country. I want to have the links to all that stuff linked here in the description below of this episode. Jose Torres, thanks again for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it, man. And I can't wait to do it again.